My task is to, talk, to summarize PARP inhibition in metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer. Uh, our body has a remarkable number of systems to repair itself. And uh, one, of course, is in our genetic material, our DNA. And there are a variety of different ways that we can fix our DNA when it's damaged by chemicals, when it's damaged by radiation. And there are ways that we excise these particular uh, areas in the genetic code, either by basic scission repair, mismatch repair, nucleotide excision repair, homology directed repair, or non-homologous non -homologous end joining uh, repair as well. And the HRD phenotype, or the homologous recombination deficiency genotype, is characterized by the inability to accurately repair DNA breaks using homology directed repair. So cells with HRD are sensitive to PARP inhibition, and this is uh, through a dual cytotoxic mechanism uh, through PARP uh, enzyme inhibition, as well as trapping of, of PARP. Uh, so you can see basic scission repair, uh, blockade, as well as catalytic, catalytic inhibition, and PARP trapping, as I said, which will induce DNA uh, double-stranded breaks, and of course, cause apoptosis and cell death. So what about the data in prostate cancer? Well, we know that about a quarter of metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer has DNA repair alterations. Uh, these genes can be either truncal or subclonal, and truncal will affect most, if not all, of the tumor cells, and subclonal can affect a subpopulation. And, and that's why when we look at these genetic reports, it's important that we look at the percentage of cells that are affected uh, by somatic mutations, because that may lead to very, very different results in terms of outcome. So prostate cancer cells with DNA repair alterations are sensitized to PARP and also uh, uh, the PARP inhibitors as well as platinum-based chemotherapy. And these are the FDA-approved PARP inhibitors, uh, two of which are approved as single agents, uh, but they have different affinities for PARP1, PARP2, and PARP3. And also uh, the one that I think that is really distinguished is telazoparib, where it has a uh, much higher rate of trapping of uh, PARP uh, relative to olaparib. So that, that seems to be the one preclinical thing that distinguishes these two, but the question is, does that make a difference clinically? So I mentioned before, as monotherapy, PARP inhibition is FDA approved. And there are two agents that are approved by the FDA. One is olaparib, and this is for those patients who have deleterious or suspected deleterious germline or somatic HRR gene mutated uh, uh, CRP cells, C cells that will progress after enzalutamide or abiraterone. Rucaparib is for a different population. Uh, these are only for BRCA mutated associated metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, treated with uh, androgen directed therapy such as uh, abiraterone and enzalutamide, as well as a taxane based therapy. So, this, there is a little bit of a difference in the approval as a single agent. And as Alan showed before, and I'm not going to go into detail with this, but we want to use these targeted agents up front. You know, we were lucky 20 years ago with Taxotere that it was a fairly effective drug, but now we're, nearly, we're looking at subtypes of prostate cancer. And again, identifying these subtypes is important to outcome, because as we saw from the data that Alan presented before uh, with Triton 3, uh, that there are differences in uh, outcome in terms of whether a patient receives rucaparib, uh, the PARP inhibitor, or physician's choice, which could either be an antiandrogen or a docetaxel-based chemotherapy. So I'm not going to go into detail into that because Alan has talked about that already. So, as I mentioned before, only about a quarter of patients are eligible to receive PARP inhibition. And how can we expand this population uh, to include patients who don't have these particular repair deficiencies? So, there is synergy between the, the PARP inhibitors uh, plus some of the second generation antiandrogens. And actually, we see this with anti-angiogenesis agents as well, and that pathway has also been looked at in terms of clinical trials, unfortunately not as successfully as it has been with the anti-androgens. So why does this work? Well, there's an enhanced blockade of androgen receptor signaling. There's the failure of androgen-dependent localization of PARP to the targeted genes. PARP-mediated nucleosome remodeling at, targeted, uh, at the target is abolished. And there's also transcriptional downregulation of the antigen targeted uh, uh, genes. So you're inducing brockiness by doing this. You're decreasing HRR gene expression, you're decreasing double strand DNA repair, and you're also increasing radio sensitivity. And this may be the reason, one of the preclinical reasons, why we see an improvement in survival uh, when we combine a hormone therapy and radiation therapy. 
So there have been three randomized trials that have looked at this particular uh, uh, interaction. Uh, magnitude uh, randomized patients with a variety of different uh, DNA repair mutations, including ATM, BRCA1, BRCA2, BRP, CDK12, CHEC2, FANCA, HDA, C2, and PALB2. And these were allocated to either receive uh, niraparib or placebo. And then two different groups were looked at, those who had the deficiency and those who did not. So if we look at the BRCA1, BRCA2 mutated patients, uh, this significantly reduced the risk of progression or death by 47%. So that part of the trial was positive. And we see that again from when we look at the different uh, forest plots, uh, the BRCA, BRCA patients seem to benefit the most uh, overall. But unfortunately, those patients who did not have uh, DNA repair mutations, uh, those were did not benefit, and the, uh, the, an early futility analysis demonstrated that there was no difference when you combined niraparib with abiraterone versus uh, the uh, uh, placebo plus abiraterone. Propel also looked at this particular question, uh, olaparib plus abiraterone versus placebo plus abiraterone. Primary endpoint was radiographic progression-free survival. And again, uh, there was an improvement uh, for all comers uh, by about eight months uh, in favor of the combination. There was a 34% reduction in the risk of progression or death with the combination. And again, this seemed to be most prevalent in those patients who had uh, HRR mutations. Uh, unfortunately, uh, when we look at the overall survival from Propel, uh, we don't see a difference uh, in the final analysis uh, uh, that's significant. So, so that did not show survival benefit. Talpro2 used uh, talizoprib combined with enzalutamide versus placebo combined with enzalutamide on a one-to-one -one randomization. And the primary endpoint was radiographic progression-free survival. As we see from Talpro2, there's an improvement in RPFS for all comers uh, by an independent review committee, 37% reduction in the risk of death. And this, again, was most prevalent in those patients who are HRR deficient. So where does this lead us? So we have three FDA approvals for combination therapy in uh, metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer, and they're, they're, they're different. Firstly, how do we select patients? Well, I, I like to select patients based upon the antiandrogen that we were going to administer. So for, of course, if I'm going to uh, not want to give a patient abiraterone, I would favor you know, the, the, the combination uh, the, the, such as talazoprid plus enzalutamide. Uh, but niraparib plus abiraterone is, is approved by the FDA for adults with deleterious or suspected deleterious BRCA mutations. It's not approved for the general population. Same thing with olaparib uh, plus, uh, plus uh, abiraterone, adults with BRCA mutated uh, castration resistant disease. And then uh, talazoprib has a little bit of a broader approval for those patients who are gene mutated uh, HRR. So what about sequence? So as we pointed out now and pointed out from his overview that, that we do have patients who uh, have prior treatment with next generation antiandrogens, it's now being used commonly. So can we think about this in terms of sequence? Well, Maha Hussain presented some data at uh, ASCO GU looking at uh, patients who are BRCA1 uh, or BRCA2 positive and or ATM and randomized to three arms, abiraterone and prednisone, olaparib, uh, or olaparib plus uh, abiraterone and prednisone. And as one would expect, there's a better radiographic progression-free survival in those patients who have combination therapy. Uh, it's 39 months. For those patients who have uh, uh, just abiraterone alone, it's 8.4 months. And then for those patients who have uh, uh, the PARP inhibitor, olaparib, it's 14 months. So I think the interesting part of this data is Maha looked at crossover. As we see, if you go from uh, abiraterone to uh, olaparib or vice versa, you don't really approach that 39-month progression-free survival. So com combination is, I think, the way to go with this. The question is, do you add your PARP inhibitor to uh, abiraterone if they progress from castration? Sensitive to castration-resistant disease, we don't understand that or know the answer to that question just yet. So in summary, PARP inhibition is a single-agent therapy is FDA-approved in patients with castration-resistant prostate cancer. 
uh, PARP inhibitors should be used prior to cytotoxic agents in those patients who have BRCA1, BRCA2 positives. Uh, ATM, it's not as clear. Um, combinations with PARP and next generation antigens should be considered for those patients with BRCA2 mutation, mutations up front who have not received prior antiandrogens. And combination therapy with PARP and next generation antiandrogens should be considered over sequential treatment. Thank you very much.